Okay. All right. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the war on history. And as we talk about this subject, um, we're going to look at some pictures. You know, pictures always make things a little bit interesting. I think we had some pictures a week or so ago, and uh, I think it makes things interesting. Uh, a lot of people uh, commented on they liked the message, and I thought some of it was kind of bookish and boring, but people insisted I continue on with the subject. This sermon was actually going to be... Um, um, one eighth of a sermon it was going to be uh, an eighth of a sermon, but I decided to break it out into a whole separate topic uh, because it's timely and uh, it's an important thing to talk about. Uh, the title of the message today is "The War on Christmas." Now I'm going to go with our text. It is July. <laughs> Christmas, the war on Christmas in July. You know what? It, it's really not that funny because one of our founding fathers said the two most important holidays in for the American people, they said it was Christmas and the 4th of July because the found, they believed that the founding of our faith and the founding of our nation were so closely intertwined. They talked about those two holidays being important. Yeah, we're not talking about the war on Christmas today. We're talking about the war on history. Now, there's a lot of things that, that we live in a, a modern culture that opposes a lot of things that are, are part of our tradition. As a matter of fact, we could probably make this a two-parter right now and say not only war on history, but war on tradition. Just plain old traditions that are familiar to us. Our text this morning is uh, from the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 111, verses uh, 3, and then verses 10 and 11, we read these words. Psalm 11, beginning with verse 3, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Asking the question, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then we go down to uh, Proverbs 11, 11, and we read these words. Proverbs 11, 11 tells us this. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. You know, there are times when things are exalted. There are times when things are overthrown. And finally, in Isaiah, in the first chapter, down in the seventh verse, we read these words. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. It seems like a lot of these things are going on in the world around us. As we look at the news, maybe not here at home, but as we look at the news, uh, there are some things that are alarming and frightening to us as we look in the world around us. Uh, last week, we talked, or a week before last, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, some of what's going on in our culture, some of the unrest. And no, in a population, excuse me, a publication no less popular than Popular Mechanics had an article entitled How to Topple a Statue Using Science, Bring That Sucker Down Without Anyone Getting Hurt. That was in Popular Mechanics magazines. I've got old, old copies of Popular Mechanics magazine up there in my office. You used to be able to read it, how to build a crystal radio set, how to build a birdhouse, how to do all these things. That's popular mechanics saying that. Here's a picture of the statue that was toppled. That's Jefferson Davis. Last week I made a mistake, and of course it's now preserved on the internet forever. It wasn't uh, when I was talking about the former uh, name for the uh, Democrat Party um, dinner, I said it was a Jefferson Davis dinner. It wasn't the Jefferson Davis, it was Jefferson Jackson Day dinner. And, uh, of course, that's been changed because Jefferson was a slave owner and Jackson supposedly mistreated the Indians. 
But here's the former uh, president of the Confederate States of America, Jefferson Davis. And of course, you know, when they started this toppling, this statue toppling business, it started out, well, we're against racism and we don't want to commemorate the, 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 what the Confederacy did. Remember, that's how all this statue toppling started. We're against racism, therefore we're going to topple Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, whoever. That's how it started, right? And uh, then uh, we were warned, some people said, if it begins with Confederate statues, it won't end there. And this, of course, is our first president, George Washington, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. I'm using this picture because other pictures, other photographs taken from different angles, there's just too much foul language and I couldn't show that in church. So a flag, an American flag, was wrapped around, wrapped around the statue of George Washington, set on fire, and his statue was toppled. And uh, he is the founder of our, one of our founding fathers, first president of the United States. Now, oddly enough, boy, this is strange. In Portland, the statue of Vladimir Lenin completely untouched. Now, between communism and socialism, uh, fascism, Nazism, uh, millions of people died. Countless millions of people died in the 20th century mainly because of the actions of communist and socialist nations. World War II and other conflicts, uh, but here his statue's untouched. You know, unmarked, uh, it's fine, nobody's worried about it. Here's Christopher Columbus. You know, a lot of people, when they start toppling statues, you hear people ask questions like, what did Christopher Columbus ever do? You hear people say that? When certain people's statues get toppled, they say, well, what did Christopher Columbus ever do? What did he do? What did this person do or that person do? Well, they've declared war on history, so Christopher Columbus is part of our history. This is in uh, Columbus. They're talking about removing the statue. I don't know if they have yet. Here's a picture of Christopher Columbus erected by Friends of Christopher Columbus Committee. And that's in Boston. That's outside of Boston somewhere. And the head got knocked off, and they repaired it and got knocked off again. And people ask, you know, a lot of people say, what did Christopher Columbus ever do? And, you know, a lot of people are, are puzzled by that. And, uh, but, you know, as we get into this, we're, we're going to realize that you, you have to stop making sense. Years ago, there was a song called Stop Making Sense. And I think we live in a world today where people are following that advice, stop making sense. Well, we're asking questions that make sense of things that don't make sense, okay? So here we go. Abraham Lincoln, they want to take this statue down. Abraham Lincoln, you know what this statue, it was late 1870s, I think it was erected, and it was to commemorate the Emancipation Proclamation. And people are complaining because it portrays an African-American slave kneeling. Well, the slave isn't kneeling, he's rising. He's getting up. Abraham Lincoln, at great political peril, after a lot of not wanting to do it, got into a civil war in this country over the issue of slavery. Didn't want to do it. Resisted, resisted. Uh, there were riots. There was disorder. There was uh, trouble in the South, and yet he, he resisted. He resisted intervening with troops until finally he had to. And there was no greater uh, abolitionist thinker than Abraham Lincoln. Not only did he risk great political, take great political risks in launching this war, uh, this civil war that eventually freed the slaves, but it cost him his life. It cost him his life. He was assassinated by a man who was committed to the Confederacy and who, who hated Lincoln because of the Civil War. Hundreds of thousands of people died. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And this statue is honoring what was done. Yet people want to take it down. People ask the question, well, what did Abraham Lincoln ever do? What did Lincoln do? Here's another statue. 
Ulysses S. Grant. What did Ulysses S. Grant ever do? All these people want to topple the Confederate statues. If it hadn't been for Ulysses S. Grant, there would be two countries. There would be the Confederate States of America and the United States of America. Half would be slave. You ever think about this? What if slavery would have survived into the 20th century, and in the 20th century, of course, people have embraced Darwinism and evolution. If slavery would have survived until Darwinism and evolution were embraced by culture, it would never be wiped out. Because people say, well, some races are more highly evolved than other races. And that would be an excuse to keep slavery going. Remember, it was the religious people, the Christians, the abolitionists were Christians. And they're the ones who fought against slavery, led the charge against slavery. Imagine if slavery would have survived until the 20th century when evolution and Darwinism were accepted. Well, here's the man who defeated all the Confederate generals whose statues they want to topple. What happened to his statue? Are things starting to not make sense to you? Matthias Baldwin. Doesn't he just look like a villain? He just looks like somebody out of a, a Dickens novel who the little boy goes and says, May I have more soup, sir? And he just swats his soup bowl away. No, you little scallywag. You know, doesn't he look like that kind of a guy? Well, let's do something about Matthias Baldwin. Let's do so well, some people have decided to do something. There's no foul language here. No. Okay. <laughs> then check. Um, they, they defaced his statue. They wrote down things like murder, colonizer, and that's some poorly written. You know, the, the penmanship of these people is awful. You know, I mean, it's just abysmal. You can tell they don't study orthography in school anymore. But anyhow, there it is, defaced. Here's a young person, only a young person to climb up there. She's going to put a rope around uh, Matthias Baldwin and pull his statue down. What did this villain do? How? What kind of a terrible person was Matthias Baldwin? Have you ever, first of all, has anybody here ever heard of Matthias Baldwin? I never heard of him until this was pointed out. Let, let's read a little bit about Matthias Baldwin. Born in 1795. Is a 19th century entrepreneur whose plant built locomotives and he argued against slavery and for the uh, right of black Americans to vote. He also used his own personal money to pay for the education of black children. He established schools for black children and he paid all the teachers' salary out of his own pocket. He hired blacks in his shops when that was not the norm. One person put it this way, the irony of vandalizing a monument to those who died to end slavery is lost on the morons who don't know their history. It is unclear exactly who is responsible for the destruction of the Baldwin statue. Similarly, rioters have defaced monuments to the 54th a uh, Union Army Regiment, regiment the first all-volunteer black regiment, and a sculpture dedicated to the black uh, soldiers is in Boston. He also worked hard to get uh, blacks the right to vote in, in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, he donated money to these children's schools, and this cost him a lot because he was an engine manufacturer, and all the southern states boycotted Baldwin's engines because he was an abolitionist. And they refused to buy his engines. Does he deserve this? <laughs> I mean, if it was happening in somebody else's country, it would be funny. To have another little history lesson. Hans Christian Hay. Hans Christian Hay. If you're like me, you've never heard of him either. Who is he? He migrated 
to Wisconsin. Well, first of all, let's look at this is his statue as it is. As it was, rather. And this is his statue as it is now. Toppled, the head knocked off, laying in a stream, laying in a creek somewhere. Who was Hans Christian Hague? Well, he was from Norway. Uh, he entered politics and he joined the Free Soil Party, which was a party centered around exposing, or excuse me, opposing the expansion of slavery into the Western United States. He was also a leader of Wisconsin's Wide Awakes, an anti-slave catcher militia. In other words, he was a militia member. You hear people talking about militias? Oh, these people are terrible. They're, they're running around carrying guns. He was a militia member. You know who his militia was fighting against? People trying to capture runaway slaves. That's who his militia was organized to fight against. People trying to capture runaway slaves. He used his position uh, in politics for... Uh, prison reform, he advocated vocational training. He was appointed, when the Civil War came along, he was appointed colonel of the 15th Wisconsin Infantry, a group consisting mostly of immigrants from Scandinavia, of course this is Wisconsin. Uh, he defeated a number of Confederate armies in battles in Kentucky and Tennessee on December 30th, 1862, Haig lost more than a hundred of his men and had his horse shot out from underneath of him. His general later called him the bravest of the brave. Haig's brigade chased the retreating Confederate army, army, army rather, to Chickamauga, Georgia, on September 19, 1863. Outnumbered, Haig was leading in the front his troops, when he was shot in the abdomen, he died the next morning. Why does his statue deserve to come down? Is this starting to not make sense to you? Let, let's talk about, let's talk about a real racist, the poetess Ann Elk. Have you ever heard of Ann Elk? Uh, she was in favor of slavery, and she was a real racist. And she used to write poems about how wonderful slavery was. I remember reading them in school. Here's a stanza from one of her poems. Slavery, slavery, everyone should be for it. Don't do your own work, make someone else do it. Have you ever heard that poem before? No. Have you ever seen a picture of Ann Elk? Well, here she is. And elk, preserved in bronze. <coughs> this racist, this uh, person who was in favor of slavery, what happened to Ann Elk? This is in Portland, by the way. There's the statue of Ann Elk, that horrible racist set ablaze. Finally, we'll erase her memory. Ann Elk set ablaze, that racist. Now, in case you're thinking, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, preacher, that can't be an elk. Because that's a male elk. He has antlers. That's what everybody's thinking, right? You ever watch Monty Python's Flying Circus? Monty Python's Flying Circus could not have made up anything more ridiculous than this. I honestly don't know why there's a statue of an elk in Portland. I don't know why. I didn't read far enough. But I do know that it was set ablaze. And it was so damaged, you know, the tempering of metal. You know, metal has to be tempered. It was so damaged by the fire. And again, you see the scrawl of the illiterates on the bottom there. It was so damaged by the fire that the city actually had to remove the elk and put it in a place where it could be preserved because the metal was... Are things starting to not make sense? How about the Little Mermaid? Now you can't see it very well, you can't see it at all as a matter of fact. 
But on the rock underneath, this is in Denmark. You know, this is about the story with Erickson, I think, the guy that wrote the story about the girl that wanted to be a human. She was a mermaid. She wanted to be human. And this statue's been there for years and years and years. What's scrawled on the rock that, that the little mermaid sits on is racist fish. You, can, you couldn't make this stuff up. You couldn't make it up. Are things starting to not make sense? You know, all this claim that everything is against racism is a lie. It, it's got nothing to do with racism. It's a war on our traditions, it's a war on our history, and it's a war on our culture, and anything is fair game. Anything is fair game. It's got nothing to do with racism. This is a quote from George Orwell, which I, I really like. This is from the book 1984. 1984, and this is what Orwell had to say. Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book rewritten, every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street and building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. And the process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. We used to have kids read books like that. 1984, Animal Farm, books like that that, that got across the idea of how fragile and tenuous our democracy is. Here's a quote from a young woman from Venezuela. She's from Venezuela. This is what, this is her comment when she looked around and sees what's going on in our country. I remember the statues of Christopher Columbus being knocked down. After that, the street names changed. Not all of them, but quite a few of them. They changed the name. This young lady's uh, name is Rogliani. Uh, they changed the name of the National Park in Caracas to something more indigenous. They changed the flag of our country. They also changed the name. They dismantled our police in 2001 and put in a new one. They changed our voting system so that the way we voted changed. She talks about the change, and it began with the destruction of statues and renaming. Well, I know what you're thinking. Well, whoop-de-doo and wave the flag, preacher. Thanks for the history lesson, but what's this got to do with the Bible? We come here to hear about religion. I think history is boring. What's this got to do with us? How is this going to help me spiritually? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with the Bible. Do you ever ask the question, who's next on the chopping block of statues? Who's next? There's already people talking about it. Erasing white Jesus from our culture, from our history. You know what, folks? They're working their way to Jesus. Because I'll tell you this, it's always been about Jesus. They can say whatever they want, but this is the real target of their venom. It's always been about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. This was the picture that was in Grandma's church, Grandma Papap's church over in Center Point, West Virginia. When I was a boy, still there, I think. And to me, this is Jesus. Now, did Jesus really look like this? Probably not. <laughs> okay. And preachers have been saying that for years and years. Jesus probably didn't have long hair. He had a beard. We know he had a beard because Isaiah tells us he had a beard. But he looked Jewish, he looked Semitic, he didn't look European. And, and we've been saying that for years. But it's not, the, it's not the appearance of Jesus that's a discussion. It's what Jesus stands for. That's the ultimate target. They want to change our traditions. They want to change our history. Why? Who's in, ultimately in their crosshairs? The man depicted in this portrait. What did Jesus say? Oh, well, first of all, I want to read the First Amendment. Why should this be important to us? What's the First Amendment tell? 
Congress shall make no laws respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Folks, we can worship in freedom in this country uh, because it's our God-given right. We live in a country where we have religious freedom. What happens when they start knocking down statues of Jesus? What's, what's the grounding of our religious freedom? What did Jesus come to say? What is Jesus and, and the crosshairs of people? Look at Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 10, beginning with verse 34. Matthew 10, 34. Think not that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set man at variance, at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, but he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. How do you describe yourself? Somebody asks you who you are, describe yourself to me. You know what should be the first thing that comes out of all of our mouths when we describe who we are to somebody else? What is it? I'm a Christian. That's number one. That's the number one defining issue of who we are. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. He said you've got to make a choice between all other allegiances, flesh and blood. I've got to be number one in your life. And you've got to make that choice. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We've got to make a choice of who is Lord. In the early church, they died because they refused to sign the paper that said Caesar is Lord. Because they said Jesus is Lord. What else did Jesus say? In Matthew's Gospel in the 5th chapter, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Did you get that line? That first line in Matthew 5.10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. You're not going to be persecuted for being bad, as a Christian, you're going to be persecuted because you are righteous. You're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake. Jesus says, bless you. There's a choice to make, people. There's a choice to make. Look in John's Gospel. John chapter 18, verse 37. Jesus is before Pilate. Pilate asks him questions in verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king, and to this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, and every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Are you of the truth? Jesus says, everybody that's of the truth hears my voice. Folks, there's a, there's a choice to make. Are you going to be on the side of righteousness? And are you going to be on the side of the truth? Or are you, are you going to be opposed to the cause of righteousness? Or are you going to be one of these people that um, isn't on the side of the truth? We've got a choice to make. The truth. What did Jesus say about the truth? In John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36, we read these words. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. 
And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Why is freedom important to us? Jesus said, you shall know the truth. What's the result of knowing the truth? You're going to be free. Remember, I can't remember if it was Solzhenitsyn or Warmbrand who wrote the book. And that Warmbrand wrote the book, Tortured for Christ. I can't remember which of them, which one of these men said this. But they were in a, in a, in a Soviet prison camp. And they said, even though they were behind bars, he said, I was the only free man there. I could speak my mind. And there was nothing they could do to me. I was already in the gulag. I was already in the concentration camp. And I was free to say whatever was on my mind. The guards couldn't. The man who ran the prison couldn't. But he could. The truth will set you free. Don't you want to be on the side of the truth today? Don't you want to be free from sin? Don't you want to be free from the power of the devil? Don't you want to be on the side of righteousness? Today, you know, when Jesus returns, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. You know, in our text today, uh, in, in the uh, book of Psalms, I didn't read this verse, but it says, God's eyes see, his eyelids try the children of men. God is watching. What side do you want to be on when Jesus returns? I want you to think about that as we turn to our hymn of decision.